Okay, let's go ahead and record. So this is exam one review. I did it today because there was a lot of confusions on exams and I wanted you all to get the, the best information you could for this exam so that you can do the best you can. And you know, you're just showing up here on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock. It's showing me that you guys really wanna kill this exam and you know, do it well. Exam one, you have that ability to do, to, uh, to do that. So um, I'm glad that you're here. So exam one review. Remember this is a, an exam, it's 55 questions, 50 questions. Uh, that's a Hesse 55. Exam is 50 questions and you have five math questions. You have all gotten my um, dosage calculation and the worksheets with it. If you look at example questions for dosage calculation, you will be okay with the type of questions that you will see you know, on exams, okay? So let's start with you know, our dreaded, let's look into you know, those theorists. You know those theorists are um, very difficult to understand. Erickson is probably the one that we talk about the most. Um, it just talks about the way the infant acts and acts uh, according to you know, those um, people around them. So as a baby, there is trust versus mistrust. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you have a baby and you know that uh, they're crying and you do not answer their cry in a reasonable amount of time, they're gonna have mistrust. They have none of their needs met and they're gonna be unhappy and they're gonna be insecure. But if you are that mother, that grandmother, whoever is raising that child, if you hear that cry and in a reasonable amount of time, go and pick them up, they're gonna have that sense of security. They're gonna be happier. They're gonna be greater disposition because they know their needs are going to be met. When we get into toddlers, so autonomy versus shame and doubt. Well, autonomous means you do things by yourself, right? So that's what autonomy means. As in toddlers can do what they wanna do. They're autonomous. The shame and doubt is when the parents say, hey, no, don't do that or the parent does it for them, and they don't have that ability to try. So they have a feeling of being shameful and doubt because they're doubting their abilities because mom's doing it all the time, okay? Initiative versus guilt. This is now your preschoolers. This is the time where they start making little decisions about themselves. Um, industry versus inferiority. This is your school age children. What do you need to come from by this? Well, industry is what a child, a school age child ages. Well, this is five to 12 and you'll see a lot of literature, six to 12, five to 12. I mean, that's where my dissertation was. And I'm like, well, what age is it? Is it five or six? You'll see it written um, many different ways. In this course, we say six to 12 because preschool is three to five. Now, industry. Now, these are those children who either run well, kick the ball well, good at math, good at reading, good at spelling, good at playing a piano, an instrument, can hit the ball the farthest. Man, they're great at it and they always get praised for it, okay? It's a task, they do well. They do it well. Well, inferiority. Well, inferiority means you can't do everything well, can you? So those things you can't do well makes them feel inferior. And then the adolescence, all about identity confusion. Well, adolescents, we know they're going through all that change from being a kid to being an adult. Who am I? What do I want to be? You know, my sexuality, boys, girls, none, both. You know, what do I like? What do I want to, where do I want to go when I grow up? What peer group do I want to be in? And it, that confusion is also about their body image. They're really always never satisfied with their, you know, selves. Freud. Freud a lot talks about, you know, the sexuality in a child. So in the beginning, this infant is all about everything in its mouth, okay? Um, this everything in its mouth is they discover the world through their mouths, right? The first thing they do is take their hands, their feet, 
and put it in their mouth or take the rattle, put it in their mouth, their finger in the mouth or their pacifier. And what does that do? It explores the world, gives them comfort, right? That self-soothing pacifier, something in the mouth keeps these um, infants very calm. And then it goes through the potty training and then it goes through um, boys are with moms and girls are with dads. Then it goes into same sex fears as um, child uh, goes through school age periods. Kohlberg. Kohlberg's all about good and bad and a consequence for each. And as they get older, it starts talking about trying to do the right thing. They're trying to be pleasers as they get older. So um, these moral developments, again, good and bad, consequence for each. And as they get older, they know what's right, know what's wrong, and they try to please. But they also will do wrong when that what they want to do makes more sense than not doing it, okay? So they know there's going to be a consequence, but they're willing to take it, but they're already going there. And this goes into more of it, you know, like that Maslow's sort of um, tower of reasoning. Play. <clears throat> what do kids do from get-go, from day one? Kids play, 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 play. You know, whether it's looking at their fingers, shaking a rattle, that's considered play. As they get older, we describe it more. Onlooker is you are sitting there, two children, one's looking at the other play. Solitary, playing alone. Parallel, both kids are playing next to each other, but they're not playing with the same, you know, things. They're, they're not intervolved with each other. They're just there together at the same area. Associative play, two children are playing together but there are no rules, there are no goals, there are no outcomes. They just talk to each other and play and make a this and a that. And you know, the dolls go flying in the air and the blocks, you know, they build and that's just associative. Now, cooperative, there is more structure. There is what you need to do to make a goal and to win. Very good example is playing checkers, isn't it? A board game. You know, that little sorry game my little grandson has and you pop the little thing, but it's Paw Patrol. So it makes it pretty neat for him, all the pictures. And he plays it. And let me tell you, that kid <laughs> loves the competition. He's beat me and Pop Pop uh, three times already. Now play, we know what play does. It's important. It develops that imagination. It uses their hands, their hands, the physical, the cognitive, their, you know, all their abilities are being used there. Um, and it helps them, you know, learn. Um, very important for the brain. And it also works with children playing together. Children need to play together. Therapeutic play is another type of play we don't discuss a lot. But this is when kids are going to a hospital and they need to have whether surgery or some examination that's a little bit more involved and we really want to um, explain it to them. Child life is an incredible group of people. I remember when they came into our children's hospital in about 2008, I wanna say, and I'm like, why are they in my room talking to my kids? These are my kids, these are my patients. And then I realized what they were doing. And then I actually, because of them, my dissertation is about comforting children, school-age children's attitude and behavior towards injections. And that's all about doing those comfort measures for them, which is what Child Life taught me all about. So I have the highest regard for them. They're great people to help your children get prepared. Now, part of assessing a child or any person is asking them about their allergies. And let me tell you, in pediatrics, you're going to hear the craziest thing. And there's going to all of these questions, they're, they're going to want to answer all at once. The most important, describe the reaction. It could be as, and I've heard this a lot, no, my kid can't take albuterol for his asthma because he's allergic to it. So I say, so describe what happens. And they tell me, well, his heart rate gets really too high and he gets really jittery. And I'm like, well, it's an expected response to it. But of course, we'll use a different sort of, um, out, you know, the um, leave albuterol, which is your Zopanex type thing, because it doesn't elevate the heart rate as much. 
But number one thing, what's the reaction? And then you can ask them all of the other questions. When did this happen? How long did it go? They ever take it again? And, you know, did the doctor or nurse tell you um, what was going on here? And did they say it was an allergic reaction? Now, working with pediatrics, remember, we're working with families. We are, it's a, you know, family-centered care. We're working with mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, um, grandmas, grandpa, depending on your culture, it could be all at the same time. You know, COVID has lifted up a lot of the visiting restrictions. So we're getting more of, you know, big groups of people visiting children. I know I've had children one kid come in with a fever and I have 10 adults and friends and family members and best friends coming in um, at the same time. So when we're doing cultural differences, we need to understand um, what they need from us. Now, I don't know everything about every culture. You never will know everything about all cultures. So the most important thing is to ask the parents and if it's an older child, ask the child, what are those differences that you need to me to respect? It could be food, they may be vegetarian, or they may not eat pork, or they only eat fish, or it could be something of the sort. If some of the cultures do not want a male nurse taking care of a female, they think that is, you know, tainting their, you know, virginity and their soul, et cetera. So asking, we'll find out. Also, some of them, you can just, you know, take their clothes off, no big deal and do things. But you no, know, let's say you have to do a catheterization on, you know, a child who comes from a culture um, that like a Buddhist that doesn't do that. Well, you know, we would make sure that we have them covered properly and not exposed all the way out in that again is um, making them culturally competent. You're doing the best for them. So always ask, ask the child, ask the parents, ask who's there, what do they need? And I always include the, the child. So assessing the child, what should we do? Now, if there's physical findings, there's physicals and assessment we have to do, right? Physical assignment is all the stuff you can touch and see in here, right? So what are those? Physical, when they come in, we're gonna do vital signs. Um, we're gonna do height and weight. And if they're smaller, we're gonna do head circumference, abdominal circumference, of course. And then we're gonna listen to the lungs. The, we're going to look at the ears and the abdomen, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all things I can touch and feel. Then you can tell me, why did you come to the emergency room and give me the reason? And that's the more of the subjective that's more of the assessment. So growth at all age, what do you, where do you think this one's going? It's going right to nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. If we do not feed a child proper nutrition, they are not going to be cognitively aware. They're not going to have growth and development the way they should, especially during the first year of life, because in the first year, an infant should double their birth weight in six months, which means born at seven pounds, they'll be 14 pounds by six months. And then by one year, they triple. And they go from a kid who cannot lift their head to a kid who's walking and running. So it's amazing the amount of cognitive and physical changes on them. So nutrition, and this goes for every stage of a child. They're not getting proper nutrition. They're over nutrition or under nutrition. Why do you think we weigh children every time they come to the doctor's office? We want to see, are they too heavy or not heavy enough? We can make changes. Looking at the adolescents and the bigger school age, looking at BMIs, seeing are they too much or too little. There are ways we can measure nutrition by what we see. Frequent assessments on children, why, why, why? Well, it's a lot of stuff to remember, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about first thing is from rolling from the abdomen to the back and the back to the belly, and that should be by six months. And then they should be able to do a crude pincer grasp and grasp rattles by seven months. Why do I have to know all that? Well, what if you were assessing an infant holding their arms and their head falls back and the kid's seven, eight months old? Aren't they supposed to have head control by about three months 
at the latest? And if they don't, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to start therapy, early intervention. I have seen such miraculous things because of early intervention. Kids are resilient, but you've got to give them the therapy and then they will catch up to other kids. How many of you have had, know of children who couldn't have speak, went to speech therapy and now you can't shut them up? That was my grandsons, my two older grandsons. You know, it was quickly they turned it around and now they're A students. Looking at the belly, remember, you always look first. Don't touch, look, then you're gonna listen, then you're gonna percuss, and then you're gonna palpate, seeing if there's anything in the abdomen that could be problems. And as we get into more of the diseases of the systems of the body, you'll understand why this is important and what we might be looking for. Cardiac assessment, you know, we've learned this in health assessment, right? Well, let's look at what the children are. Where is the aortic valve? Where can you see it? The pulmonic valve, the tricuspid and mitral. And we can hear, are there murmurs? Are there swishing goings on? So part of the cardiac assessment is knowing where these things are and listening to them. I know in your capstone, you are going to have to know where to put your stethoscope for your valve. So this is actually a refresher getting to capstone, okay? Warning, I used to do a lot of the um, capstone simulation checkoffs and I used to watch videos. So I know this happens. Breath sounds. What are you listening to when you listen to a child? Now, children have a lot of upper airway mucus. It's just who they are. They don't blow their nose as good. You know, things sit. So you might think you're listening to rails or ronchi in the lungs, but all you're listening to is tracheal breath sounds. So if you're listening right there um, over the trachea near the supersternal notch, you know, which is right, you know, right into about right there. What are you listening to? Well, that's all upper airway. You know, bronchial vascular, it's like you're having this both, but the vesicular is always the lower lobes, you know, and you're listening to pure lung. So bronchial, it is over that trachea. And again, that's upper airway. Car seats. You know, I told my students that little metal box up there, I remember my brother being in that. And the crazy thing, it was in the front seat. And he sat next to my mother in the passenger seat. And I sat next to my father who was driving. We were all in the front seat and we were two years apart. That's how they have changed. So what do we do today? Rear facing, and it's going to be, um, rear facing back seat up to the age of two, and then you can turn it around. We know they should be in booster seats till they're eight, and they should be in the back seat until they're 13. All of these changes have come to keep our children safe. Remember, buying a car seat is the best thing to do, getting them its presents, or using one that maybe your friend had that, you know, maybe the kid only used it for two months, so you know what the age of the seat is. Don't go to a garage sale. Don't buy something you don't know anything about. And don't use one that was from your brother's kid from 10 years ago. It must be something new. They expire. And our goal by instituting car seats, and it was right around when my kids were born, my son is going to be 40 next year. So that's how long ago we started car seats. And it's all of the things about it have changed. And here's more information about it if you indeed need it. Now, vaccines, we know that there's the HPV and we use this for your adolescence. And it is about nine years old. We know that males also get this too. And it is uh, two vaccines, six months apart. Um, and we know the HPV is you know, trying to help these children. Hepatitis B, remember, it is three injections that they do get. And if they didn't get it as an infant, you know, if they're getting it later on in life, it needs to be three. Infants, you know, I think infants are great. And I, I, the one part about it is, and I'll be honest with you guys, when I was working in pediatrics, I could, I was going for certification and I could be a certified pediatric nurse, which is knowing all about growth and development and taking an exam on that or I could be a certified pediatric emergency nurse, which it was all about trauma, you know, and all of that high stress level stuff. 
Well, I did the trauma one because I didn't want to do growth and development because it is hard. It is hard to remember all this stuff. So, you know, remember if you can, the sequence of events for gross motor skills, you lift your head up and then you're on your belly, to, uh, turn over to your back. And that should be about five months when they're done. Now, when we know that, remember if they're five months old, these children shouldn't be on a couch. They shouldn't be anywhere unsecured. They will roll off. I've had many of parents come in with even two months old that have rolled off their changing table, rolled off their beds, et cetera. So this is things that we should be teaching our parents. They should be um, grasping objects. Remember it is first um, reflux, then it goes to voluntary grasp, then it goes to pincer grasp, and again, everything in their mouth. We know T starts at the bottom little ones and by eight, it should be eight minus six is the thing or nine minus six, that's how many teeth they should have. But if they don't have them, then it's not a big deal. I told my class that my children and my grandson never had teeth by a year old. At 15 months, they got six at the same time. So you can imagine the pain. Yes, all three of them, I guess it's hereditary from me, I don't know. They should be able to pull themselves up about nine months. And one of the big things is sitting unsupported by eight months of age. That means they can probably go from their back, turn around, sit up and sit there. You do not have to put pillows and prop them. Colic. I think this is one of the hardest things for parents to work with. You have a child who's having colic. Um, it is... Uh, something that affects the whole family. This kid doesn't sleep much. You know, you are calling the physician, you are changing formulas, you're rocking them, you're burping them, you're, you know, giving them medicines. It's, it's really, really difficult. Now, it usually only lasts, you know, a couple of months, you know, but what if you get a phone call, you know, and we know about colic as um, pediatric uh, professionals. You get a phone call, let's say you're working in a doctor's office, you get a phone call and you say, you know, my infant, he's like six, four, six, eight weeks, whatever, young, little. And he's saying, crying all the time. I don't know what to do. You know, I, you know, I keep feeding him, you know, he's burped. I, I don't know what to do. Well, don't tell them to go out to get little gases. You know, those silicon drops. This child needs to be seen by a physician. Remember how brittle these children are in the first six weeks of life. Those, any kid, infant going into an ER, six months, uh, six weeks or less, comes in with a complaint, they are a full emergency and get into the ER first. They don't have an immune system. They can't fight anything. We need to treat them quick. So don't take it as a colic because it's what it sounds like. Get them in to see the healthcare provider. Developmental periods, you know, these are all a bunch of different names. It describes their behaviors and what they're able to do. So sequential is that predictable. We know that they lift up they, their head up. Then they're from their abdomen, they roll to their back. They're back to the abdomen. Then they're on their knees. They crawl, they creep, they stand, they walk. This is all in a sequence. We know that's gonna happen. Does it mean they might skip something? And that's okay, as long as they're moving forward in the sequence. Developmental ages, you know, this is as they get older, we know that they're gonna progress when they're ready. Whether they wanna walk then, they're not. Um, and they're gonna wait. My children were developmentally, 15 months is when they ran. They got the teeth, they never walked, they ran at 15 months. And that's just part of developmental. And then, you know, these area sensitive periods is as they grow in, in, in their mind and it's that cognitive awareness and development. Fontanelle, now Fontanelle could be um, written many different ways. This is, you know, another way, the English way of writing it, but it's still a Fontanelle um, without the extra LE on the end. We know we have an anterior and we have a posterior and knowing when they close is important. The posterior should be closing about six to eight weeks. Well, what if it closes earlier? Well, you've got this really uh, sensitive brain that can't grow, right? Because remember, you're growing so much as an infant. The anterior should be 12 to 18 months. Well, then I'll say if it's still open, then 
what do we need to do? Because is it, there is water on the brain, hydrocephalus, there's a tumor, it needs to be investigated because that brain needs protection. When babies are born, they don't see well. I mean, I think all of you have heard about those black and white mobiles because they don't see colors yet. And you see it, these little babies with these cross eyes. Each eye works separately, you know, and you'll see with this eye and this eye, then all of a sudden they'll cross. And it's called binocularity. By 12 months, these children do see a lot better. And what this understanding the eyes working together, that's where you get your depth perception. They're able to put their hand out and grab it because when eyes aren't working together, they have no idea of the depth. Pain, you know, this is probably one of my pet peeves in nursing, not treating pain adequately. Now, what do you see with an infant? Well, an infant's gonna cry, but they'll grimace and that little chin will start quivering. Their eyes get so tight and they're gonna start with the hands and the feet and they're going to be moving, thrashing and they're gonna be whimpering. So how do you treat pain? How do you evaluate pain in an infant? This is your FLAC scale. Infants from zero to three years old is the FLAC scale. Faces, activity, legs, um, consolability, all of this is what you'll see. SIDS. This is a lot in the first um, year of life. Infants who are high risk for uh, SIDS death, males are more than females. If you have them too hot, if there's cigarette smoke around, if they have had a recent, you know, little boogery nose, little, you know, mucus and a little upper respiratory, those are more apt to get it. Um, we know that premature babies, of course. And then we also know that if you're breastfed, you have less incident of SIDS death than a formula fed baby. And we know that they should be in a crib with nothing in there. It shouldn't be soft. They shouldn't be able to smother their face in there. And of course, back to sleep, only on their back. Newborns have a lot of reflexes and we can test their neurological status by these. You know, if we look at them, remember that fine motor, it's that reflex, that reflex, you know, grasp thing. That's a reflex that we look at. And then of course it becomes voluntary. We know stroking a little cheek, you know, when we look at um, that suck reflex, you know, that is, I'm ready to eat. And then the moro or startle reflex, make a loud noise or bang the crib and the hands come up and that's that startle moral. One thing that helps a child if they're going to fall is this parachute reflex. You know, they tend to put their hands out and you know, as adults, we still do that. It's called a parachute reflex. So this is just a step out of gross motor skills. Remember, there's fine motor skills, which means F, fine fingers. <clears throat> so fine motor fingers, think of everything you do with your hands. That's grasping, building blocks, putting them in blocks, building, uh, putting them in containers, taking them out. That's all fine motor. Buttoning a button, fine motor skills. Gross motor, is get up and go, 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 like Paw Patrol says. Lift your head up, roll over, get up on your knees, crawl, creep, walk, run. That is all part of gross motor skills. And you can see how it um, advances as it goes. And it, again, if you know the sequence of events for lifting the head up, turning from front to back, back to front, and then crawling, you will know about the months for that. Toddlers. <laughs> these are the kids that are everywhere all the time. Um, these children are, are very jittery and nervous um, around anybody else except parents. They, they have these attachments. They don't want anybody else to touch them, pick them up, you know. Uh, so how do we work with the toddler? Well, I, and even some preschoolers are the same. First of all, minimal approach, sort of be there and don't be threatening. Then get on their level. I like to sit down next to them. I like to ask them about, wow, you got big, beautiful blue eyes or, oh, I saw your sneakers light up. Do they run fast too? 
or, oh, Spider-Man, that's on your shirt, or, oh, you love princesses. I always had stickers in my pocket for girls and boys. And let me tell you, I could do so many things with kids because I started out extremely slow. And in the end, my job was a lot quicker that I spent those little bit of extra times. And also remember, as you're doing an assessment on a toddler, even though you've gotten there, you know, they're okay with you, make it a game, play with them. Say, oh, is this your ear? Let me look at your ear. And they go, <laughs> and especially, you know, it's a little bit of an older, but no, your ear is here. And they could tell you and you can laugh. And it does, it minimizes that stress. Toddlers, pain, what do they look like? Well, I think a toddler in pain, number one, they're not gonna be themselves. They're gonna sit, they're gonna to wanna to sleep, they're not gonna be hungry. And you know something's going on. You know, if they're crying, that's obvious. Grunting, breath, breath holding, that's part of it. But just a change of behavior, eating less and not playing, something's wrong. Is it pain, is it a fever? What's going on? Again, still, pain for a toddler ages one to three, is the flax scale, okay? It's that facial, it's that, you know, um, their legs moving, those restless, uh, their activity, their crying, and consolability is a big thing. So that, and it works great. It, this, you can actually do a great pain scale on these children. Remember with children, infants, that at one year old is when we can change formula to whole milk. Whole milk is um, something that we do um, when we change it at that point and it's whole milk. It's not skim milk, it is not 2% at this time unless otherwise stated by a pediatrician. This is what they need, whole milk you can introduce. Preschoolers, this is my grandson. He's going to be six in January, so he's growing out of it. So I've been living preschools. Now, we know Kohlberg, again, right and wrong and a consequence for each. Now, at toddlers, we start to say that they know there's a difference between right and wrong. They don't understand it quite yet. But as they get older and into preschoolers, they know if they don't do something, they might go on timeout, right? So if you don't do that, this is the consequence. So they're starting to try to do what they're supposed to do. How many of you have preschoolers and have about a thousand band-aids in your medicine cabinet? I think I have about a thousand. You know, I have from Spider-Man to Paw Patrol to regular band-aids, all different sizes because a band-aid is a miracle cure. The, a lot has to do with um, Bleeding and now the blood stops, so they're not going to have a lot of bleeding out. Yes, Alvira. <laughs> I was just wondering, do we need to know signs and symptoms of anemia in children? That or as, we, as we get to anemia, we're going to do that in hematology. And yes, okay. you will know it then, not now. No, no, okay. We'll thank you. We'll open that more, but thank you for that. Thank you. Pain scale for preschoolers at age three. Three to eight, we're gonna use faces. And children three years old, you can put down their finger and you could say which one hurts the most. And it does correlate to the pain scale. And they will show you if they hurt a lot or a little. And you know, on my badge was right there, that faces scale. And I say, okay, which one do you feel like? And they would show me. Preschoolers, they're gross motor. So this is get up and go, go, go. They're running, they're riding bikes, they're playing basketball, hitting things, right? They, at age three, they can walk a line and balance on a little beam. They can skip, gallop, walk backwards. I think when my uh, grandson learned how to walk backwards, he thought it was the neatest thing. Um, they can pedal a tricycle, catch a ball, jump with one feet, two feet, don't matter. Ages four to five, gross motor they can stand on one foot. And it, this is something that it does happen about then. They can go on tippy toes, they're starting to jump, jumping over little things, and they're becoming more and more coordinated. 
fine motors, fingers, right? What do they do? Fine motors, look at this. We can draw and we're more in the lines. We can button a shirt. We can put toys together and maybe make like little objects like, you know, bigger blocks and make little bracelets and whatnot, as long as they're not really tiny, tiny. Preschoolers is the preempt to kindergarten. And as a parent, we as nurses need to teach them that getting them ready for kindergarten involves a few things. Now, one of the one things is some children only go to daycare, you know, occasionally. I mean, today, most kids have to go when the parents are working, but there's some that don't. And now this is going to be going to preschool, breaking away, putting them um, in, in an environment where they have to perform a task, they have to listen, and they can't be disruptive. So as they get ready to go to kindergarten, there's not going to be nap time anymore. It's going to be more time in school, and it's going to be more time doing lessons. So as parents, tell them how much fun school is, how much um, they're going to learn and get smart, you know, reading to your child very important. You know, I have to commend my daughter. She has about a hundred or 200 books for this kid. And every night she will read three to four. And at this point, this little boy, he's going to only be six, just, just went to kindergarten this year. He can read words and he could read big words because that the mother kept reading and showing in the words. And if they're not in preschool, you can get them involved in some sort of social events, maybe putting them in gymnastics or putting them in little sports things, things that are geared towards the kids. That means he's cooperating with other kids and learning, which is what school does, okay? And talking to these children in real words, not in baby talk and using complete full sentences will help this child be smarter school age children. Obesity in school age children has become an epidemic. Why? Well, it's all of those electronic devices, right? They are on the phones, they're on their iPads, they're on their games, whatever the game of the season is, I don't even know anymore. And they're watching TV and they're not up out moving. Sometimes it's because the neighborhoods aren't good, but um, they should be encouraged to get up and go out and to run. I mean, Michelle Obama was very into get up and go out and, you know, exercise at least an hour a day, which is great. You know, teaching nutrition, this is the best time to teach them. You know, preventing obesity, it starts in, you know, mommy's belly. Good nutrition should start then and they should be eaten properly starting then. And they should be educated. You know, what happens if these school age children become obese? You know, they end up getting their body, the cardio metabolic changes where they're gonna have hypertension and high cholesterol and um, diabetes because they did not take care of it as school age children. And remember school age children wanna please, right? They really wanna please. And the one thing is it doesn't matter the race, the culture, it's all cultures that have children that can be overweight. So we need to prevent obesity from, in, you know, in mommy's belly and then make sure they're educated so that we can prevent obesity in children. In school age, same sex peers, you know, this is something Freud says, right? Boys and boys and girls and girls. You know, they, you know, remember these children, peers, if they want to do something, the other peer is probably going to do the same thing, whether they want it or not. I mean, maybe a girl uh, wants to do cheerleading and the other girl wants to do ballet. Well, if the one with ba doing ballet is more forceful, the one who wanted to do cheerleading may, may do ballet because she wants to be with her peer. Okay. Very important concept. Wants to please the peers. So preparing a kid for procedures. Again, get on their level and see what they understand. You know, if you told a boy, I'm gonna send you and get an X-ray, they might think little rays of gamma rays are coming out of the eyes and it's going to zap through their body and it's gonna hurt, right? They don't know, 
they know an x-ray, <laughs> how do they know? So tell them, you know, it's a camera. It's a big camera. It's overhead. It's going to go move back and forth. It's going to make noises. It's not going to fall down. It's not going to hurt you. But we can look at your insides of your body. And the one thing I always did is I let my children see where their pneumonia was sometimes, or especially this is your broken arm, your broken wrist, your broken leg, so they can understand so that they know how to take care of themselves. Because once the cast on, they feel better, they don't realize, right? They forget about it, but that visual does help. Doing assessments, we need to be creative, you know, even infants will stick their tongue out. If you go up to them, stick your tongue out at them, they're gonna to try to put their tongue out. So assessing is just sticking a tongue out. Your lymphatic system is uh, something in children that should be non-palpable until they're ill, okay? You know, remember the body is constantly fighting over germs and infections and that's how the immune system works. But the lymphatic tissues, the lymph system, those nodules should be non-palpable most of the time. Dental health, remember in school age, it starts with all of the baby teeth coming out and it goes to where puberty starts. So now, most of all, brushing is the most important. You know, flossing is good, but many children can't. Uh, as you see here, first graders do not have the manual dexterity to floss property properly. Now, this could be five, six, seven-year-olds, okay? They don't know how. So brushing is the most important. <clears throat> and they do I'll recommend soft bristles and fluoride toothpaste. And now adolescence. Leading cause of death in adolescence is these unintentional injuries. We know cars, it's always gonna be a part of it because they're now driving. <clears throat> but it's that, you know, homicide, that's finding guns and picking them up and think they're big enough to touch them or getting in with the wrong group. And it's homicide is a big part of, you know, this. But remember also suicide can be there. Homicide, um, car crash, homicide, and then suicide because of why? Well that intense slowliness that they get, that, you know, body image, I'm not good enough. I don't, you know, I don't like my, the way I look. Self, you know, image, that body image. Children, um, as they get into adolescence, you know, they've gone through that adolescent growth spurt. They're bigger now, they look older, they think they're older and they want all the privileges and no responsibility. And they become rebellious with it. So usually this occurs about ages 15 to 17. That's that middle age of adolescence. And they're gonna be testing boundaries and testing mom and dad. And I say, hold on to the roller coaster ride because this is when you really need to pay attention. Now, how can we help this child? Well, there is a lack of communication and all there's gonna be is yelling back and forth. So they could sit down, make some sort of contract with the parents, with the child, that maybe that could work to help, you know, keep the kids safe because, you know, adolescents, do a lot of risky behaviors and they still need to be kept safe. Now you get an adolescent into the doctor's office, into an ER, and you need to talk to them about sex. Maybe they're having chronic urinary tract infections and you have a suspicion that maybe it's due to having sex. So you need to find out. Now you are an adult you are a threat too. You are, you know, the people in charge, right? You're the institution. So how do you get on their level? I mean, it's easy with little kids, you know, bring out the stickers, tell them you love their Spider-Man shirt, but <laughs> an adolescent ain't going for that. But starting asking them about their social life. Do they listen to the music? Do they like to go to movies? Do they play sports? How are they doing in school? Are they gonna to go to college? How are their grades? You know, find out, build trust, open it up there. Or maybe you notice that they had the coolest Nike sneakers out on the market and maybe you say, hey, I wanna get it for my nephew or my kid. Where'd you find them? I mean, now you've opened up that you're listening. 
Also, if a child is looking different, a, a girl looking like a boy, asking this adolescent, how do you want me to call you? What name you want me to call you by? Earns deep respect, deep, deep respect it does. So when you're listening to that adolescent, listen. Let them express their feelings and be prepared for them to say some crazy things and to be shocked because I have been shocked and I don't shock often. So try to keep the face, you know, that poker face, but, you know, give them that time. So build up that bond, ask them about themselves, start talking with them, and then you can um, talk about sexual feelings. Another thing about talking uh, about Children, the adolescents with sex is get the parents out of the room. Remember, you can have the parents leave. You do not have to have uh, parents in the room to speak to the adolescent. The only time you have to tell the parents what's going on is if what they're doing is going to harm themselves or others. Okay, but if they're giving you information that can help you treat what's going on with them, you know, that's a plus for the child and for their care. So that's what we want the best for the child. So this is that confidentiality, you know, where you tell them, I don't have to tell your mom about this. Okay, I just want to know how I can take care of you. And if it is that they're having sex in this urinary tract infection, tell them the tricks. You know, it is said with research, urinating right after sex helps prevent it or taking a shower or washing or, you know, these things can help prevent. Now, adolescents, because of this puberty and because of these growth spurts, which is a lot, they should sleep a lot. They do not. Why? Well, they're too busy with homework and all their social obligations, going to the football game, going to the movies, going to the mall, you know, all of this stuff, staying up, doing their homework, texting all night long, right? This is what these teenagers do. Now, this is why they don't sleep enough. Now, when we're talking to these adolescents, we need to tell them sleep is very important along with proper nutrition. You know, what do adolescents do? They grab a Nutrigrain bar and a bottle of water and go out for the day and they don't have time to eat and come home and eat dinner, right? That's not proper nutrition, especially if they're in that place where they're having that growth spurt. Now, Tanner stage of development will actually show you as a healthcare provider, where are they in this stage? Well, we know that stage one is kids. Stage five is your mature adult. Stage two is the first thing that happens. So in girls, what do you see first? You start to see those little breast bubs. They're starting to get breasts. And then boys, I mean, we usually don't get a chance to see our children's, you know, scrotums, but their scrotum, their testicle enlarges. That's where they start. And then it's the different sequence of events. So Tanner stages of development, very important chart that, you know, you're going to be seeing this again on your NCLEX. They love to look at Tanner. So just remember that. Keep it in your mind. We know there's five dosage calculation problems. If you have my handouts for that um, YouTube channel that I sent out, you guys are gonna do great. So, you know, I wish you the best. I wish you good luck. I will have this posted um, as soon as I possibly get it. Get it. it takes uh, maybe 45 minutes to have it, you know, processed and come up with me, but I'll get this out to you all as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate y'all for coming. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Professor Goa. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Y'all need Thank anything? You know, okay. Thank you, Professor Professor Goa. I have a question. I'm sorry. Professor Josie saying that when you see Josie, it's just Lady Matos. So I don't know if you want her to change the name or you can do it by, by her. I don't know. My official name is just Lady Matos, but the, um, the child is Josie. In the my story. class. Yes, yes, yes. Okay.